Well, good morning, church family. Welcome. It is week six or seven of this. I just like to say this so that when we look back at these videos, we'll be able to remember this time that we were in and what week it was. Uh, we are excited and glad to have you joining us this morning. Uh, if you are new to our broadcast, every week we are seeing more and more people joining us uh, from this local community as well as reaching other states, uh, even other countries. So it is exciting what God is doing even in this time and how he is using this. Uh, so if you are joining us for the first time, welcome to Jesus Fellowship. Uh, we're going to have a great morning together. We're going to start off by singing some songs uh, and then Pastor Mike will have a great message for us out of the book of Galatians. Uh, before we get to all that, though, we do want to focus our hearts and begin with some song. We invite you to sing with us if you would like, or just allow this music to prepare your hearts uh, for the receiving of the word and to enter into worship. Uh, and to do that, we wanted to begin by reading from Psalm 32. So as we read Psalm 32, starting in the first verse, blessed is he whose transgressions is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Selah. I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. For this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they shall not come near him. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse or like the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit. Just lost it, Mike. There it is. And bridle, else they will not come near you. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. The command of this psalm is to rejoice. And to rejoice is simply this. To rejoice is to dwell on who God is, what he is, who, what we have done, and finally, what he has done for us. So we would encourage you this morning as we sing these two songs, they're gonna show us this. They're gonna show us who God is. They're gonna show us what we have done, and they're gonna show us what he has done and what he has done for us. So together, let's begin to sing. From the darkness I called your name Into darkness your mercy came You called me out, lifted me up How great is your love You are my weakness presence where I belong you called 
they're so tender is calling us home he welcomes the weakest the vilest the poor our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the lord praise the lord singing along with us. We thank you for joining us. I'm going to hand it over now to Pastor Mike. It's good seeing you all, even online. I personally miss you guys. I look forward to seeing you hopefully soon. Good morning, everybody. Uh, and I echo Joe's sentiments that uh, I'm getting tired of doing this online in a sense. I wish we could be back together and we should be uh, praying for God's mercy in that regard that he would move on this situation. That he would sovereignly act in a way that is just we ask for his mercy on this and we ask for his grace to continue no matter what the outcome is. But that being said, let's go ahead and get ready to continue worshiping as we proclaim the Word of God today. We are going to be concluding the fifth chapter of Galatians today. We have been working through this in our series called Rest. Um, last week, we 
dealt with a pretty heavy passage. Um, it was the passage de- outlining the works of the flesh. and It was basically a big listing of sin that we are to be repenting from and turning away from as followers of Christ. If you made it through that and you weren't thoroughly depressed and uh, destroyed, hopefully by the message of the gospel being proclaimed in that, that there is no sin too great, that Christ cannot atone for it, but there is no sin too small that does not need atoning. Um, We are going to be entering into the passage today detailing the fruit of the Spirit, and this is the defining characteristics of the Spirit-led life. Um, Our idea that we want to hammer home today in our text is that those who are walking by the Spirit, those who are walking in the Spirit, this was the language that Paul has used earlier in this fifth chapter, you will inevitably bear the fruit of the Spirit. That is uh, the promise of the sanctified Spirit-led life. Those who are led by the Spirit will bear His fruit. And it's very important that we uh, frame today that our hopeful rest is not in our personal effort or some form of asceticism where we dis- discipline our body and I'm going to just just beat myself and, and grieve myself until I feel these things like love and joy and I'm not going to just force myself to walk in this. Our hope is that we have been crucified with Christ and likewise our sinful nature and our fleshly desires and our lusts and our affections, those too have been crucified with Christ. And this only comes through the hope of the gospel, which is why every week we endeavor to make sure that the gospel is being proclaimed, the gospel being that Christ, the Son of God, would give himself as an atoning substitutionary sacrifice for sinners like me, like you, and that we rest in that. It is the gift of God by grace alone, not through anything we're doing. And we rest through faith in the finished work of Christ. And as a result of that, we now walk changed, transformed, and sanctified. Now, last week I mentioned that if we isolate any of these particular passages, these verses, like if we isolate just the the works of the flesh, we can very easily use it as a club to beat people with. And say, ha, I see this in your life. You're, you know, you are not a Christian. Or I see this in my life and I suffer depression because I wonder about the assurance of my salvation. But remember, if our hope is built upon Christ and Christ alone, his sacrifice alone, not my effort, not my work, then I should have hope. I should have assurance. And likewise, when we come to a passage like this, this is not a list of things for me to do, right? This is not a list of things I must check off as I walk as a Christian. This is, however, a list of things that the Spirit will bring to bear in my life and in your life as we walk as Christians. The fruit of the Spirit is the inevitable work of the Spirit in our life. And those that are walking by the Spirit will bear this fruit. So let's open up to Galatians chapter 5. If you're not there already, we're going to be in verses 22 through 26, closing out our chapter. Paul writes in verse 22, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law, and those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we praise you that we can come and still hear from your word despite being separated. Lord, we thank you for all the technology that you have given us and blessed us with as part of your common grace. But God, we pray, first and foremost, that we would be impacted by your word spoken today, that your spirit would move amongst your people to comfort the brokenhearted, to convict us of areas where we need to repent of and turn and yield in submission to you. And Lord, we also come before you and ask for your mercy upon this nation, upon this community, upon this world, upon mankind in general. Lord, that you 
would just allow us to come back together again. Lord, for the, for the common good and edification of your saints, that we would be able to join together in corporate worship, in corporate song, we ask your mercy upon this body. But Lord, even, even if we were to never gather again in person, we know the truth of the gospel is all that we need. We know that the work of Christ is all that we need. And Lord, I pray that your people would cling to that hope, that cross more than anything in this life, more than jobs, more than family, more than comforts, more than security, more than anything that they could possibly think they need. Lord, impress upon them that they need Christ. And Lord, let this word going forth from me today be glorified to your Son. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's begin today looking at the context of this passage. As we want to close out this chapter, we want to see how it relates to those verses preceding it, how it's going to relate to those verses coming in chapter 6, and how it relates to this letter as a whole. Like I said before, we don't want to see this as an isolated to-do list. Please do not look at God's revelation of who he is to you and what he has done for you in Christ ever as a list of, I must check this off and do this. It's not the point. It's not what these passages are here to detail. And like the works of the flesh list that we saw last week, this is not a comprehensive list. Very often, Paul talks in kind of broad, brushstroke generalities about what sin looks like and what the fruitful, spirit-led life looks like. If we look in 2 Peter chapter 1, there's another list of fruit of the Spirit, as it were. It's virtues. It's the elements that a Christian, a a regenerated grace, saved by grace believer, will naturally, inevitably produce. And they're not the same list. There are a lot of similarities, but it's not the same list. So if I'm using this passage as my to-do list, I'm in trouble because I'm not doing all of it if I check off all these things. But furthermore, if I'm just trying to check things off, I'm missing the point of what the Spirit is doing in me as I walk out my Christian life. Now, these particular virtues, they're most likely selected by Paul to emphasize the Christian's response to the particular issues and divisions that were occurring in the Galatian church. So, A lot of these focus in on Christians loving one another and how we can be in community one with another without offending the other or how we can be serving another individual. These uh, fruit of the Spirit tend to focus in on such. We're talking about love. We're talking about peace. We're talking about kindness, goodness, self-control. All of these issues that help us relate to other people. But we also want to link this back to verses 13 through 15 in this chapter where Paul talks about our liberty in Christ. Just as a refresher, I'll read them real quickly. I don't have the scriptures in the screen. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word. Even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. This is all interconnected. We can't isolate this passage from the rest of chapter 5. Walking the Spirit-led life, walking out these fruit, will inevitably, inevitably go back to this part of the chapter where we're fulfilling the law in love where we are loving one another. But if we're biting one another, if we're devouring, if we're backbiting, if we're gossiping, if we're cutting down, we are not walking as evidenced by the fruit of the Spirit. Now we're back to the fruit of the the works of the flesh, right? My uh, natural tendencies coming forth. But Paul also said we're to crucify these with Christ. We're to put away the natural man. We're to love our neighbor. Now, moving forward in chapter 6, as we close out this entire letter, chapter 6 is going to serve as more of an a exposition or an explanation of what these fruit look like, practically speaking. We're going to talk about bearing one another's burdens. We're going to talk about loving the saints. We're going to talk about doing good to those in the household of faith and not growing weary as we walk that way. So that's going to further expand upon this list, which further expands upon chapter 5, which further expands upon the entire book of Galatians. I want you guys to see how all of these things are connected and not in isolation. 
And as part of the larger letter, Paul has been talking about law and grace, law and spirit, the gospel and works, and how all of these things connect. And we've got to keep anchored in our mind that we are justified. We are made righteous. We are made right before God. We are saved, not by our efforts, ever, 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 ever. You can never mix those things. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone. Because of Christ alone. You ever start mixing those things, you're going back to the Galatian gospel. The false gospel of works plus faith. It is grace and grace alone. Yet, because of grace, because of the gift of faith that you have been given, because of the spirit dwelling within you, there will inevitably be fruit. And you will inevitably do good works. But the good works and the fruit, all of that is a consequence of the gospel. It is not the gospel. The gospel is the free gift of salvation in Christ that is made available to wretched, sinful men and women, enemies and haters of God, by God himself. He says, I will give of my son that you may live and it is purely and freely a gift. Believe. Rest in that. Trust that word. And when we rest in faith in Christ, having our flesh crucified with him, we can see his lordship through the power of the Holy Spirit manifested in our lives. We will be fruitfully obedient to God's law. And that is, again, the overarching emphasis of the first four chapters. We're not saved by law. We're not saved by works. We're not saved by obedience to any of these things. Yet there's nothing antithetical about God and his law. There's nothing antithetical about grace and the law. There's nothing antithetical about the spirit and the law. These things are not in opposition unless you're trying to be saved by the law. But if we understand that we're saved by grace through a gift, through faith, The law serves its purpose now to show me, to lead me, to guide me in fruitful obedience. And therefore, we can be like the psalmist who says, I love your law, O Lord. It is a light unto my path. So let's move here into our uh, example of what doctrine is being taught in this. And the key takeaway that I need you guys to get in the sense of the Spirit-led individual, those who are walking by the Spirit, we will produce... We will bear. We will show this fruit forth. It's because it's the Spirit's fruit. It's not yours. In John uh, 15, Jesus talks about abide in me. Right? He is the vine. We are the branches. He nourishes us. We bear fruit. Apart from me, Jesus says, you can do nothing. Well, that is true like in this passage. Apart from the Spirit, I will not produce these fruit. I am not naturally a good tree. I am not naturally spirit-filled. This had to be a work of regenerative grace by the Holy Spirit. Yet once he has born this new tree, right? he has birthed this, regenerated this, created this as it were, I will inevitably produce fruit after my, light, after my tree status, after the likeness of Christ. Fruit bearing is an inevitable response of the work of the Spirit, but it is Him producing that fruit through me. Now, this doesn't preclude the fact that, yes, I will need to yield to Him. Yes, I will need to submit to Him. I can hear all the outcries already. It's not me sitting back and doing nothing. Yes, the the Spirit will produce this, but yes, I am also responsible. I must repent. I must submit. I must yield. I must cultivate this fruit. Yes, amen. But it's his fruit. If I look at what I would produce naturally, it would be the flesh. The spirit must produce spirit. Now, something that is very important, and some of you may know this about this passage. Some of you may have never heard this before about this passage. But it's important to note that in verse 22, when Paul says, but the fruit of the spirit is, and then he makes this list of virtues, That word fruit in Greek, karpos, is singular. There is only fruit. It's not that love and joy and peace and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control and all those things are individual fruits, plural. 
They are all virtues that flow from the Spirit being present. The Spirit gives fruit. He produces fruit, singular. It's either you're producing fruit or you're not producing fruit. And why this matters is very often people will be like, well, you know, I've got the fruit of love and I've got the fruit of of joy, but I'm not very self-controlled. I don't have that fruit. Or I don't have the fruit of peace. I don't have the fruit of gentleness. Well, you're wrong. You may not see a lot of it, You may not be actively cultivating that fruit. You may be resisting the Spirit in that area, in that virtue. But you either have the fruit of the Spirit or you don't. You are either regenerated with new heart and new desires or you're not. You're either walking by the Spirit or walking by the flesh. You don't get to pick and choose which parts of it I like and which parts of it I don't like. And I'm going to live in this area and cultivate this, but I'm not going to worry about seeing this in my life. The fruit is singular, and he produces it. Now my question, believer, is are you yielding to and cultivating and desiring to see the fullness of that fruit bearing out in your life? Are you cultivating all of these virtues as the word of God would lead you and guide you, empowered by the Spirit? Or are we resisting him? Are we, are we seeking to say, I don't want to be good and kind and patient and peaceful and gentle and loving? I want to be just the one fruit. I want to be just this one aspect. Or are we saying, I must submit every aspect of my life. If I'm going to claim to be crucified with Christ, and I'm going to be claiming to be a Christian, and I'm going to be claiming to be spirit-led, then I need to be yielding, receptive, and responsive to the Spirit so that all of these virtues may be seen. So he may bear the fullness of this fruit in my life. As an apple tree will inevitably produce apples, right? Right? Apple trees don't produce oranges. Apple trees don't produce figs. Apple trees don't produce burritos. Apple trees produce apples. I mean, a burrito tree would be pretty baller, wouldn't it? Anyway, apple trees produce apples. So therefore, those who are in union with Christ, those who have been joined together by faith, those who have crucified their flesh and their desires will inevitably bear the fruit of the Spirit. We should be seeing all of these fruit to one degree or another. They're not optional. Now, some may be more and some may be less. And there may be areas that we are still resisting and there may be areas that we need to to yield. Yes, that is true. But our goal, our desire of our new heart should be to see all of this virtue, all of these elements of this list coming forth. Because it is the Spirit who bears these fruit. It is His work in us. And again, I must remind you, those who walk in the Spirit, those who walk by the Spirit, will bear this fruit. Now, let's touch base on some of these uh, virtues in this list. I'm not going to hit all of them. Unfortunately, we do not have time for that. But I want to start with love, because this is at the top of the list. And someone has said this. I tried to look up who the quote is so I could properly attribute it. I don't know. I couldn't find it. But it has been said, love is the root of all the fruit. Love is where all of these other virtues flow from. Love is the central fruit, the central virtue that we should be seeing produced. And when I say love, I don't mean love as Humans often understand love. I am referring to love, as it says here in the Greek, in the agape form of love. Now, if you know the word agape, if you've been in church for more than five seconds, I'm sure you've heard that term thrown around, but let's break it down. What is agape love? Agape is the type of love that God himself Demonstrate. So when scripture says that God is love, it's referring in the Greek to this agape. There are three other words used commonly in the scriptures to refer to or translate it as love in English. They're all different. See, we're kind of limited in our English language. We say love for my wife and love for macaroni and cheese, and we're not very descriptive. Now, I'm not saying that macaroni and cheese and my wife are on the same level of love, But that's just, I mean, she's looking at me now, so I have to say this, guys. But, like, you know, we use that word universally. But what does agape mean? It is a love that is gracious. 
And when I say gracious, we mean uh, it is self-originated. It is not in response to anything in that person. So when God, Scripture says in 1 John that we love God because he first loved us, right? He loved us when we were at our most unlovely. He loved us when we were dead to him. We, he loved us when we were his active enemies. He loved us not because of something he saw in you, not because of some good virtue in you. He did not choose to set his affection upon you for any reason other than he loved you. It was an act of his gracious self-choice. It is Agape is love that is unearned and unmerited. It's not because of anything. It's not because, wow, you know, Mike was a really good guy. He's a really faithful man. I am going to shed my love upon him so that I can use him. No. That's not love. Not agape love. Oh, Joe's a really good buddy. You know, we hang out. We have a lot of common interests. So therefore, I'm going to love him. That's not agape. There's another word for that in Greek. But that's not agape. Agape says this person is worthless in and of themselves. They have no redeeming value. There is nothing good in them. There's no benefit that I'm going to get out of it. I am still, however, choosing to love them. Now, you might be like, well, that's pretty bad, Mike. I don't like that. I can't help you guys. That's what the word, that's, the, that's, that's how the word is used. Now, but you're like, Mike, I thought we're supposed to agape our spouses. Are you telling me that I should look at my spouse like they're worthless? No, absolutely not. And that's not just because my wife's looking at me, right? How we're supposed to actively agape or love our spouse or our kids or one another or our enemies, because agape is used in all of those contexts in Scripture, we are not to look at that person and say, I am going to love them because of da 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 I'm not going to love my spouse because they're loving me first. I'm not going to love my, my children because they're obedient. I'm not going to love my enemies because there's something I want from them. No, I am merely going to choose of my choice alone to love. No matter if they hate me. No matter if they reject me, no matter if they despise me, no matter if there's nothing in, in it for me, there's no gain for me, even if that person is completely whacked out and crazy, agape says, I see that crazy and I love you anyway. In the same way that God saw us and he saw wretched, depraved, sinful rebels. And he said, I will love them anyway. Joy, because we all need a little joy now after that line, right? Joy, this is the idea of delight. And it is a benefit of having, having received and experienced God's graciousness to us. Joy is that, is that I don't want to say on, in emotion, because this is beyond, like the fruit of the Spirit, these virtues are beyond just what we understand as emotion. But this is that expressiveness of, I cannot believe how gracious God was to me. I cannot express the gratitude that I feel that he would forgive me and remove my guilt from me. I cannot contain the joy that I experience because of what God has done for me in Christ. And you cannot help but experience joy when you reflect on the graciousness of God in redeeming and saving his wicked enemies. So if you're new to this church, you're new to this broadcast, uh, very often uh, I, I, I try to hammer home to our people the point that you deserve nothing from God. You were a rebel. You were a sinner. Yet God in his grace has given you not only what you don't deserve, he has not given you judgment, he has not given you death and hell as we deserve as sinners, but he has gone beyond that and he has given us more than we deserve in that he has given us forgiveness and life eternal with him in his kingdom. He has given us every blessing in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. God has given us beyond what we should have received. But it's very easy to get into the habit of just agreeing with me to get me to shut up. Like, oh yeah, Mike, I know we're sinners. Oh yeah, I know we deserve death. 
Oh, yeah, I know we should be judged because we're wretched people. I'm glad you're listening, but you're not really listening. Because after that sentence is invariably a but. Oh, yeah, I know we're all wretched, but I'm not that bad. I know we're all sinners, but I'm less of a sinner than that person. I know we all deserve hell, but no, it's just, get the truth. You deserve hell. You deserve death. You deserve judgment. You're a sinner. You have been saved by God's grace. And that is the only reason you have not received those things that you deserve. And don't use this as a qualifier now to say, I am this, but I'm not as bad as my neighbor. Yeah, you might be right, because you might be worse than your neighbor in actuality. Because we're just getting heavy right now. You thought, this, you thought talking about the fruit of the Spirit was going to be an uplifting sermon? Ha <laughs> ha! Got you. Let's go to meekness and gentleness. Meekness and gentleness. Depends on your English translation. Um, I'm using a New King James as I'm reading here in verse 23, and it says gentleness. I want to focus on this one particularly because of how it's traditionally used in Greek literature. It's used to talk about animals. It's used to talk about those animals that were broken and yoked, those that were in submission, those that were under someone. And yet Paul is using that agricultural language to describe the Christian. We are to be yoked under the lordship of Christ. We are to be in submission. We are to be humbled under his graciousness to us who do not deserve it. And as a result of that, as a consequential fruit of our humbling, as a consequential fruit of us realizing that we don't deserve anything good from God, we recognize how we are to react and to respond to those around us. We are to act kindly. We are to act humbly. We are to act gently. We are to act all of these virtues that we're seeing, loving, peacefully, with control and restraint. All of these things as a direct result of the lordship of Christ over us. When Jesus says, come unto me all you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take upon you my yoke. It's not just a cute little metaphor of the rest that we find in Christ. His yoke is a yoke of lordship. We don't get to claim the lordship and the salvation and all the benefits of being Christian and then still do what we want, act how we want, say what we want to other people and say, well, you know, I'm acting in love. If they got offended, that's their fault. We are called to submit to Christ in thought, deed, and word. We are called to walk out, as Paul said, 13 verses earlier, 10 verses earlier, whatever it is. I can't do math. We are called to walk out the law of love, seeking the other's benefit beyond mine, seeking to elevate, seeking to raise up the other, in, do, in so doing, fulfilling all the law. We are to be friendly rather than hostile, to other men. The fruit marks the godly man whose being the law of God has been written and obeyed. So this fruit that the Spirit is producing in us is in relationship and in fulfillment of the law that he has written in our hearts. So in the Old Testament prophets, in Jeremiah and in Ezekiel, the, the, the prophets write about how the Spirit of God will put the law of God into our hearts. It will etch on our hearts, and we will walk it out. See, without the Spirit, we are powerless and helpless, and we have no desire to love our neighbor and to love our God as the law commands. But because of the Spirit, he will produce the fruitfulness of loving God and of loving neighbor, and we will walk out the law by his power in us. Because the fruit is produced by the Spirit as we are yielding in submission to the call to crucify our flesh. As we yield, we will see more of these virtues. We will see this fruit produced more. But we can't be yoked with Christ and resisting his call and his command and expecting to see fruit. Okay? So if, 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 if the idea is if you have an apple tree, right? And you're trying to see apples be produced by this tree, but you're covering it up with a tarp so that the, the leaves never see the sunlight. You're never going to get fruit, ever. You can't photosynthesize if there's no sunlight. 
We have to remove that tarp and let the tree produce naturally. Likewise, we must remove or repent from or turn away from our own fleshly sins and desires and allow the Spirit to supernaturally do His work, the work that will inevitably follow, fruit. So how should we apply this text today? Those walking by the Spirit will bear His fruit. If that is our argument and our thesis, how do I take this and apply it? First thing I need you to hear is that we are not to judge our justification based upon our sanctification. Now, if you don't know those words, basically, we're not to judge our salvation. We're not to judge our standing with God. We're not to judge that we are adopted and loved by the Father based upon our sanctification or our maturity in Christ. Our fruitfulness. Remember, we're not saved by our fruitfulness. We are saved by the faithfulness of Christ. Just because I'm not seeing all that I should see, don't let that come in and force you to question whether or not you are justified and saved before God. The only reason you are saved is by putting your faith in Christ. Because we're only saved on the basis of Christ. We're not saved on the basis of my fruitfulness. Just as trees grow and bear fruit at different rates, you, believer, and I will bear fruit at different times, in different ways, in different measures, in different amounts, at differing levels of ripeness. We're not all the same. So please do not measure your justification by someone else's sanctification or by your own. If you cling to the cross of Christ by faith alone and you believe that the atonement was made on your behalf, you are justified, period. Now, believe me, let me encourage you to seek to be sanctified by the Spirit every single day. Don't just live in the realm of immaturity. Don't just live in the realm of, I'm not seeing any fruit. I just have little tiny shoots and buds on my, on my branches. No. Cultivate that fruit. Trim that tree. Fertilize that ground. Yield to the Spirit, please. But don't judge your justification based on if I'm not seeing all of these virtues. We cultivate this fruit as we crucify the flesh. This is our next understanding of application. If Paul constantly goes back to this idea of being crucified with Christ and actively crucifying my desires, this is something I must do. Twice here in chapter 5 alone, Paul is talking about Christ and us being crucified. He talks in verse 24, and those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh. We've put to death our own passions and our own desires. We, in verse 5, right, we, have, we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. I'm waiting for this fruition to come forth by faith. It's not something that I can force. It's not something that I'm, you know, just by my effort, hammering myself over and over and over again. I rest in faith that the Spirit will fulfill His work in me. Yet, at the same time, I seek to turn from myself. I seek to turn from my own sin. I seek to yield to what the law of God would call me to, and I yield to the Spirit's leading and prompting as we walk this out, loving and serving our neighbors. See, it's a delicate balance there, but it's, we've got to have this understanding that I can't force an effort my way through the Christian life. I'm going to eventually come to a place of burnout. I'm going to come to a place of realizing that I'm actually trusting in my own works. I must yield to the Spirit, yes, but I must trust the Spirit of God, that it is His work in me. The book of Philippians, Paul writes that he who has begun a good work in you will see that work through to the day of completion. It is God at work in you to will and to work his good pleasure. One such way that we turn from sin and self 
is that we are to love one another, to agape one another. As God loved us when we were unlovely, we are to sacrificially choose to love those who can be difficult to love. I'm sure you all know someone who is difficult to love. Heck, you might be watching this right now next to them. Don't look at them. Don't turn aside to them. Don't pat them on the knee and say, yeah, babe, that's you. Okay? But understand that there are, there, in our everyday life, we are going to encounter those who it is. It will take a majestic work of the Spirit to make you want to love them. Particularly in our day and age when everything is, an, is a great offense and everyone is angry at all things at all times and we just want to rage against one another because we are empirically right and everyone else is emphatically wrong. But that's not what the scriptures call us to. The scripture calls us to put away ourself and to love that other person. It is not enough to cease to do evil. We must also learn to do that which is good. That's, again, another quote. I can't find these quotes. So, you know, sometimes you're like, man, I know I've heard this somewhere, but I don't know where. That's my life, I feel like. Right? It's not enough that we cease to do evil. It's not enough that we cease to stop sinning. It's not enough that we look through the works of the flesh and say, hey, I'm not doing drunkenness anymore. That's awesome. Hey, I'm not doing sorcery anymore. Hey, I'm not doing hatred anymore. Hey, I'm not jealous anymore. It's not enough to just stop those things. We must stop those things, yes. We must turn from them. But I also have to learn to love and to do that which is good. And notice I said we must learn to do that because it's not natural to us. It takes a work of grace. It takes the Spirit in me. But cultivating spiritual fruit will be the real and sincere endeavor of the Christian. See, it's very easy in our culture, to say I'm a Christian. I believe in God. I believe there was a Jesus. Therefore, I am a Christian. That's not what it takes to become a Christian. That's not what it takes to be a Christian. It takes a work of God's grace upon my heart to turn from my sin and trust in Christ. That is what it means to be a Christian. To repent of sin. To put myself and my desires to death. And to follow after my Savior. That is what it means to be a Christian. To trust in Him and in Him alone. And to seek after His righteousness. That's very different from merely a words coming out of my mouth. A mere profession. And if you're sitting there and you're like, I don't know what you're talking about, Mike. I don't know how, how, how am I going to crucify myself? How am I going to put the death stuff? You use some really dark language. Well, it's the language that Scripture uses. But if you're unsure of how to do this, this is where we use the law as our guide, right? It's known as the third use of the law. It's how I look at the law of God, and I say, well, God has some very specific language on how I'm to do business with people. God has some very specific language on what my sexual ethic should be. God has some very specific language on how I am to worship Him. God has very specific language because God's a specific kind of God. And those specifics help guide and shape my understanding. They help guide and direct me. When I have a question about what kind of business deals I should be doing, I can go to the book of Proverbs. And I can look at all of the wisdom Solomon has left there about what is right in God's sight and what God hates as far as business. About cheating and lying and defrauding people. Yeah, that's right out. But if you're not sure if that's what you're doing, compare your practices with what the law has. Let the law be a lens for you to interpret your life. The more we heed this, the more we turn from ourselves and turn to the word as our guide, the more we will see our flesh and selfish desires crucified. Oh, again, you keep using this term crucified. I'm like, why? Isn't that just what Jesus did? Turn back to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, 
But Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. There is so much in that verse, we could do a sermon just on that verse. Don't worry, Joe, I won't. We'll get you out of here. I have been crucified with Christ. This is a past tense statement. Right? This is a statement of being. This is an indicative. I have been crucified with Christ. So what is the result? It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So when we talk about crucifying our sin and crucifying our flesh and our desires, it is an understanding that if I can truly profess and lay claim To Christ, the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Substitute. He died for me. He hung there for me. He atoned for me. If that's my profession that I lay claim to, then he must live in me and he must live through me. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Which brings us to our last application. Instead of seeking our own futile glory, warring with one another as would-be gods, we now seek for God's glory alone. Paul began this section of Galatians 5 in verse 13, right? He says, for you, brethren, have been called to liberty. But then he ends that little section in verse 15 by saying, but if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. He's talking about interpersonal relationships. He's talking about how we interact with one another. And he closes out this very section in verse 26. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. He's bookending all of this, the works of the flesh, the fruit of the spirit, bookending it, on how we interact with one another. And if we're brutally honest with each other, at the heart of our sinful flesh, at the heart of our own desires, is the same old lie from Genesis 3, you will be like God. The reason we are sinful, the reason we rebel against God, the reason that we reject His law, His standard, His desires, is deep down inside, I want to be God. And I want to be God, and you want to be God, and we all want to be our own little gods. And the problem is, is when you've got a bunch of little gods running around, every single one of them wants to be the God. So I will war against you. I will war against my spouse. I will war against my employer. I will war against my children. We're all at war, one with another, in our natural state. But see, that's the thing. The Spirit of God does not call us to live in our natural state. We are called to live Christ-like. Remember, it is Christ in me who lives. And I, I live by faith. Because I, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the things not yet seen. Because there are days when I don't see myself living like Christ in me. I see myself living selfish. I see myself living like a little God again at war with everyone else. It is by faith that we live, Paul says, and the just shall live by faith. We walk every day by faith. As we seek for God and His glory alone through bearing His fruit. I'm going to close with a quote from Matthew Henry, great Bible commentator. He says, Our Christianity obliges us not only to die unto sin, but to live unto righteousness. Not only to oppose the works of the flesh, but to bring forth the fruits of the Spirit too. It's not enough for us to just lay claim through words to the title of Christian or follower of Christ or disciple. There are active things we must do. We have responsibility. We are to put to death our own self and desires, and sin. We are to live for God and His glory alone. We are to cultivate these fruits. We are to learn to love and to do good. These all take a constant awareness of our need 
for the power of the Spirit of God. It takes our constant understanding that unless we are immersed in God's Word, we will choose our flesh over the Spirit all the time. If we, seek to, if we desire to see this fruit of the Spirit bearing in our lives, we must be in the Word that that same Spirit of God inspired. Let him lead you and guide you into all righteousness as he reveals it to you in his word. And as we seek God and God's glory alone and not our own self, not our own glory, the fruit will inevitably be born in us. Those who walk by the Spirit will see the Spirit's fruit. And this walk is walked every day by faith. It is not walked through your own efforts and white-knuckled attempts. Rest in the Spirit. Rest in the, the gospel of Christ. Rest in God's saving work in you. Believe that. Trust in it. Rest in it. And know that God never fails. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I just pray that your Word has been accurately and articulately set forth that we can rest in your promise. We can rest in the gospel of salvation by grace alone, the gift that you offer us. And all that you demand from us is that we would believe, that we would rest in faith and trust in Christ and his work alone. We would not add to that. We would not take away from that. We would cling to Christ and Christ alone. And as we walk this life by faith, we would really and truly understand the statement that the just, those who have been declared righteous by you, we live by faith. And that we would be encouraged that your word never fails, your promises never fail, your spirit is at work in those who believe, and that even when we do not see the fruit in its entirety, your promise is that you will see it through to the day of completion. You will bear with us in grace and in love because you are the God of grace and love. Lord, I just pray that your people would live for you and for your glory alone and that our daily walk and our daily life would glorify Christ. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. All right, guys, thank you for joining with us today. Remember, we have three Bible studies throughout the week that we're running, Monday and Friday. We're doing our core Christianity at 7 p.m. on Monday night, 10 a.m. Friday morning. And then Wednesday night, we have our scripture study. We're still working through prayer, what it is. This week, we're focusing on what it is not. Remember all those questions that we couldn't get to uh, because of time constraints last Wednesday. That's at 7.30 p.m. this Wednesday. Hope you guys can plug in with us on one of these studies, Monday, Wednesday, or Friday. Thanks, and God bless. What we do here is go back, 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 back.